Today, I want to talk about voltage sources, specifically the difference between a real and an ideal voltage source. We'll also talk about the oft overlooked but equally important current source. So if you ask me what a voltage source is, I might say this is a voltage source. It has some lines and a number telling you the voltage, but I also know that this is a voltage source, a battery. This is an ideal voltage source that I write in a schematic, and this is a real voltage source that I actually have to plug in. So what precisely is the difference between this and this? Turns out that's actually a fairly interesting problem, and we'll get into that. But first of all, let's just define what a voltage source is. That's going to create 1.5 volts in this case between this point and this point, no matter what. If it's left unconnected, if I put a wire between it, a resistor between it, an iPad between it, it's going to have 1.5 volts dropped across it, no matter what. A real voltage source, as we'll see, cannot do that. But before we get into that, let's take a very brief pause and think about what a voltage actually is. All right, so what is this voltage that our real voltage source is creating here? Well, we can't see it, but surrounding this battery everywhere is an electric field. If we could visualize it, it would look something like this. These arrows represent the directions of the electric field. So if I have a charge on a drumstick like this, uh, it's a positive charge, let's just say, these arrows would tell us the direction that this charge wants to accelerate. So if I put it here, it would go this way. If I put it here, it would go this way. So this electric field here is pushing around charges. It's physically moving charges. Now, as a charge starts to move, it gains uh, kinetic energy. And that means that there is some potential energy somehow stored in this configuration. And that's really what voltage is getting at. Sometimes a voltage is called a potential difference. A potential difference, and that's not a potential energy. It's the potential energy per unit charge. So if I had one charge, if I had one electron, it would be the amount of potential energy it had divided by that electron. So it's the energy per charge. In fact, a unit of energy is electron volts, EV. Particle physicists like to use this a lot. And that's the amount of energy that an electron gets going through one volt. So that's what a voltage is theoretically. It's an electric potential, which is an energy per unit charge. Okay, sometimes what you see is a map of these, this potential here. It looks like this. These are lines over which the potential, the electric potential, is the same. In other words, this charge has the same amount of uh, potential uh, anywhere along this line. These lines are called lines of equipotential. And in fact, we could actually give these numbers. It turns out the absolute value is not physically meaningful, but the, the, the relative value is. This might be uh, 0.8 volts right here, this line. This line might be, for example, 0.9 volts. And that means I moved this charge from here to here, I would have lost 0.1 volts of uh, electric potential. Okay, now this is not super useful for electronics because we wanna not move single charges, but large quantities of charges. And we wanna direct them in a particular way. Now when we move many, many, many charges, uh, we get what is called a current. A current is change in charge divided by the change in time. And now we get a feel for what a voltage actually does to our circuits. It causes current to flow because each charge will want to move because it has this stored potential. And as long as we give it somewhere to move, it will cause a current to flow. So a voltage is what causes a current to flow, but fundamentally, I like to think of it more like this. Okay, so that's what a voltage is. It's a measure of how much potential there is between two points. And when we're making circuits, we don't really want to think about electric fields and charges being pushed around. Really what we want to do is we want to create a specific potential difference between one point and the other. In other words, we want to transport our lines of equipotential, and we have just the sophisticated device to do that right here. A wire, a conducting wire. Now as a result of uh, electromagnetism, it turns out that a conductor is going to create an equipotential anywhere along its surface. So what it actually allows us to do is to transport a potential from one point to another. Let's have a look at that. Okay, so let's test this claim out. I have my wires, which are hopefully going to transport a potential, an equipotential, uh, anywhere across a circuit that I want, and I have my real voltage source here. So first of all, in order to test that, let's just make a very cheesy connection here with uh, some electrical tape. Not the best way to make a connection, but let's see what we can do. There's my minus. And we'll measure with a digital multimeter. Let's see here, we'll clip the black lead, the negative, to 
with an alligator clip down to this wire here. And we can hopefully measure anywhere along this wire and see what we get. And it looks like we get just over 1.5 volts, oh, well over, it's a healthy battery, 1.579 volts. And that is the same no matter where I look along this potential. So this wire is creating an equipotential anywhere along it. Okay, I could in principle run some current now. In fact, let's do that. So I'll slide in a breadboard here and connect it up. Now, these two are not connected, but what I've done is I've created lines of equipotential where anywhere along this line here, we have 1.58, we'll say, uh, volts. And on the other side, zero volts. I guess I didn't really check that, but let's do that now just to verify my multimeter. I get 0, 0.00 volts anywhere along this wire. So that is our wire creating our equipotential. Now let's actually measure a current we might flow through here. So how do you measure a current? If you might recall, we do so by passing the current through the multimeter. So instead of going directly here, what I'll do is I'll put this multimeter in the circuit. So this is gonna measure my current. And we'll pass through the multimeter, this multimeter here. While we're at it, let's just ver verify the voltage here at all points. So we might not be surprised to see that there is no current flowing. Well, because we don't have a complete circuit. So let's actually put some current through here. We'll have a uh, one kilo ohm resistor roughly. So we should hopefully get uh, 1.5 divided by 1,000 amps, 1.5 milliamps flowing. And it looks like that's about what we get. We get about this divided by 1,000. This is in milliamps. So this is current flowing through there caused by the voltage. Okay, so anywhere uh, to the left here on the circuit, we have 1.5 volts. Anywhere on the right, we have zero volts. And the element that we're plugging in here, the resistor, is the dividing line. Okay, so now we know what a voltage source is. It's a device which creates a fixed potential difference across its terminals no matter what. We also have uh, a wire which creates an equipotential across the wire no matter what, the same potential. And we can see that we're going to run into a bit of trouble here if we try to hook up a wire across a voltage source because we have, by definition, a fixed potential difference and an equipotential. Uh, so we have both a different and the same voltage and something is gonna break. So how will nature get us out of this one? Well, we can think of this as a limiting process. We had our one kilo ohm resistor and our 1.5 volt source. We got about 1.5 milliamps. If I crank that resistance down to one ohm, I'd get a thousand times that. I'd get about 1.5 amps. If it was a milliohm, 0 0.001 ohms, I should get 1500 amps. And we see where this is going. Eventually, as it goes to zero, we're gonna get infinite amps, infinite current uh, flowing from our battery. I can pretty much guarantee that's not gonna happen. Uh, but what is gonna happen and why? Let's have a look at that right now. If we replace this one kiloohm with zero ohms, in other words, if I just put a wire here, if I connect them, then this is both 1.58 volts across this and zero volts. So something's gotta break and what's gonna give? So let's actually just try that. I'm gonna reach for a little bit of uh, eye protection just in case, should be fine. And uh, I'm gonna protect my uh, multimeter as well by putting it on a high current setting. Let's see what kind of current we get flowing if I create an equipotential across here. Okay, so we get about 2.3 amps and we have 0 0.8 volts dropping, of course. And my battery is a little bit warm. Now, some of that voltage might have been dropped because of the resistance in, these in the breadboard here. So what happens if I go, I'm just curious now, how much current can a 1.5 bat battery draw? Let's find out really quickly and intermittently. <whistles> about 6.7 amps. 6.7 amps of current through this 1.5 volt battery. Okay. So we had our, our voltage source created our 1.5 volts and we measured with zero ohms resistance, we measured two things. We measured 6.8 amps of current. Okay, that's quite a lot. So we had a resistance of V over I, uh, which is about 1.58 divided by 6.8 or very roughly, 0.23 ohms 
And it turns out the fact that we got a finite and not an infinite current here is precisely the difference between a real and an ideal voltage source. In fact, this allows us to build a model of, an, of a real voltage source as an ideal voltage source with some internal resistance. And importantly, in our model, we cannot access this resistance. We can never put probes between this ideal voltage source. We can only access the terminals outside of this box. And in this case, we had about 0 0.2, 0 0.23. Now, full disclosure, some of the resistance was due to this multimeter, but even if I had, I, I would argue that even if I had a superconducting uh, uh, multimeter, which would be a little bit overpriced, um, it beeped at me, I didn't like that, uh, I would still get a finite current. A real source, a real voltage source, can only draw so much current, so a real is a ideal source in series with an internal resistance. And we call that internal resistance the output impedance. Okay, so let's explore the implications of not having a zero output impedance. Let's have a finite output impedance. To do that, I've taken this nice bench top supply, which has, I've verified uh, before, a very low output impedance. And we set it to 10 volts. Okay, 10.02 volts, fine. And to mimic a high output impedance source or a fixed output impedance, we have a one kilo ohm resistor here, and this is gonna be our new source. So just to verify, we had 10 volts there, and here's my new voltage source here. And what do we have? 10.02 volts, just as before. So this is the same voltage source, it just has a different output impedance. Now let's try doing something with this voltage. We'll start with a pretty easy thing to do. We'll drive about what looks like uh, one mega ohm, if I'm reading those lines properly. And I'll hook it up. So we should get a very small current going through here. And let's see what kind of voltage we got dropped across here. Oh, nice, 10.02 volts. This thing works as advertised. We get a 10.02 volt source. Let's draw a tiny bit more current from this thing. And I'm gonna draw drive a 100 kilo ohm load. Should be straightforward, 100 kilo ohms. We're gonna get our 10 volts, aren't we? And we do that and we find we get 9.92 volts. Okay, maybe a rounding error? I don't know, it looks like 9.92 to me. Let's continue this trend. So 10 point, 100 kilo ohms was problematic. Let's continue this trend and we'll go to another factor of 10 down. We got brown, black, orange, that's 10K, 10 kilo ohm resistor, and we'll drive about 0.1 milliamps of current through it with our 10 volt source. No, one milliamp, I can't do math, through with our 10 volt source. And we get, what, nine, 0.12 volts. We get 9.12 volts. That's not 10 volts. It's not even that close. It's 10-ish. Well, what happens if we continue down even further? I'm going to put a 1 kilo ohm here in our source and see if we get our 10 volts that is advertised from our source. Time will tell. Time is told. We do not get it. We get half what we expected. Oh man. So this is really starting to fail when we have lower and lower resistors. Let's just put in 100 ohms just for fun. What do we get with our 100 ohms? We get uh, 0 0.92 volts, practically nothing. What is going on here? Well, this is the whole point of output impedance. Okay, so we can actually kind of see now that we have this somewhat fictitious example or contrived example at least where we have our imposed output impedance. But remember that our battery our battery has some internal output resistor as well. And what we can see is happening here is we had our 10 volts here. We have our internal resistance, which is one kilo ohms here. And we can connect it to stuff. If we connected it to a given load, RL here, we're going to get current flowing through this thing. So what happens if this is a thousand or ten thousand kilo ohms, ten mega ohms or one mega ohm. Well, this kilo ohm resistor here is nothing. Almost all the voltage is going to get dropped across. Whoops, I'm going to move this onto screen here so you can see my subscript L. There we go. Uh, this load resistor here is going to totally dominate this thing. We actually get, if you want to know the term, we got a voltage divider. 
between this and this. In fact, there's an equation, I can't help but putting it, V out over V in here, and this isn't super important, but let's not worry about it too much, uh, is given by this. And this we have our one kilo ohm here. So if this is like a thousand over a thousand plus one, it's not gonna make a difference, right? So as long as this is very large compared to that, we're gonna be fine. But if one, what happens if this is one kilo ohm? There's equal voltage dropped here than here. In fact, we saw that we had 10 volts, supposedly, but only five was dropped across here because the other five was dropped internally. And for 100 ohms, it's even worse. Almost all the voltage is dropped here. So what we want, a good voltage source, we want our output impedance small. We want RL much less than our output impedance. Oh no, or, <laughs> I've said it totally backwards. We want it much greater than our output resistance. Okay, forgive me for that error. We want our load to be much bigger than our output resistance. Sorry about that. All right, so how are we gonna accomplish that? Well, we have two routes, right? We can make our easiest route as a designer of a voltage source is to make this as small as we possibly can. We want a good source is gonna have a small R out. We want to make this as small as possible. So this good source here probably has about 0.1 ohms of output resistance because then we don't have this error, which is called, by the way, loading error. The other side of things, we're the green designers here. We're designing this voltage source. We wanna make this as small as possible. The red designers here, uh, making the device that we plug into, they wanna make their input impedance, the load, as big as possible. But that's perhaps a different video, okay? So we want a very small output impedance. If we have a finite output impedance from our source, we're gonna get errors, we're gonna get loading errors whenever we plug into something that has comparable output impedance. And of course, the ultimate case is when we had zero ohms across here and only finite current could flow, okay? So that's the deal with ideal versus real voltage sources. Okay, so now we know the difference between a real and an ideal voltage source. A real source is an ideal voltage source in series with an internal resistor. The smaller that resistance, the more ideal the source. But there's also current sources. And just like an ideal voltage source creates a given potential no matter what, an ideal current source, which we draw this way, pushes a certain amount of current through it no matter what. So here I might have a one kilo ohm resistor and a one milliamp source, and it's gonna push one milliamps through that. If I change the resistance, the voltage is gonna change across this resistor because one milliamps is always coming from the source. Now there's a real and an ideal version of this as well. We can kind of see a problem already. Imagine if I made this a bigger and bigger and bigger resistor. Well, I'm gonna to have to somehow create more and more voltage to get uh, my one milliamp through it. And eventually I might disconnect the thing entirely and have infinite resistance and I require infinite volts across here. So something's gotta break, just like the case of the ideal voltage source. So let's find out what goes wrong with this current source. And to do so, uh, we'll just build one. Okay, so here we have our constant current supply. So essentially what we have here is our current supply, which we can program to be any current we want. And we want to know the details of that very quickly in case you're wondering. This current supply is a very simple one, very simple adjustable supply you can make. It just has a voltage divider to create a variable voltage here to ground. And we put that to a base of a transistor. Since all the current flowing through the transistor basically flows through there, and we can set this voltage to be whatever we want. We just have a well-defined resistor here, and here's our constant current. Both of these will be connect, uh, connected to some voltage, plus 15, say. And that's our very simple current supply. And what we've also done is connected an ammeter across it, so we can measure how many milliamps is going through. That is what is coming to this end here. So this is essentially our current supply. We have the other end here, and we can send whatever current we want through. So, for example, we can drive an LED. Let's do that, let's plug an LED into here, and we'll turn on our ammeter to see what kind of current we're getting. And there we go, we have our 1.02. Now, just to be picky, I'm gonna adjust this resistor here to make sure that I get my nice uh, one milliamp. Okay, so we got our nice 1.00 milliamp here. Constant current supply. So this is very handy. For example, we might wanna drive more than a LED. 
Well, maybe for example, we want to drive two LEDs. One milliamp going through both of these LEDs. Maybe we want to drive three LEDs. Again, no problem. We have three LEDs and one milliamp. So this is a constant current source. We might even want to drive this. I couldn't help but put it through. This oversized, crazy excuse for an LED that looks like it comes out of Super Mario Brothers Giant World. And that will still give us one milliamp. So unlike a uh, voltage source, a current source has no problem being short-circuited. It's quite easy to drive one milliamp through zero ohms. There we go, we have a wire coming across. We have whatever we want to plug in here uh, should have one milliamp, even if that is zero ohms. Let's try something else then. Let's try a 100 ohm resistor. Before, 100 ohm would give us a lot of grief with our in our current our voltage source example, but no problem. We get uh, one milliamp, it looks like. By the way, one milliamp through 100 uh, ohms, what kind of current, uh, voltage should we get there? In fact, let's just measure it. Being experimentalists, we're gonna measure the voltage. So we'll measure whatever voltage drop is coming across here, right? So now all we've done is we'd, we've added a voltmeter here between these two points. And let's see what we measure. Pretty close to our 100 millivolts. As we, and we're running out of batteries. All right, well, let's hope they last for this video. Uh, okay, let's keep going with this. We're going to measure now uh, across one kilo ohm. We still get a milliamp. Of course, now we're closer to one volt across this maybe 1.1 or 1.05 kilo ohm resistor here. That's our 1K, no problem. It's 100 ohms, and we got our 0 0.1 volts. 1,000 ohms, we got our one volt, approximately. Of course, these resistors all have tolerance. Let's get another resistor here. We have a 10K, and nice. We have 10 volts across one milliamp. This is all what we'd expect, right? 10 volts is one milliamp through 10K. Now let's get 100 kilo ohms. And we no longer get our one milliamp. We only get 10.66 volts. In fact, what would we measure if I unplug this? 10.7 volts. So this is what is called the voltage compliance of this source. It can only create so much current because it can only create so much voltage. All right, we can increase the voltage of the source going to the transistor, give it higher compliance, but that is a key characteristic of this thing. So that is the limitation of this. So it's quite opposite. So what's going on here with this compliance voltage? Well, it turns out we can make another model, a model for our current source in the same way that we made a model for our voltage source. Now, it turns out here, it looks like as long as the thing we plug into has a small impedance or much smaller than some equivalent impedance to the source, we're okay. And the way we can model a real current source here, a real current source, and that's going to be equivalent to an ideal current source with an internal black box resistance, again. And so if we have infinite resistance between these two, how does nature solve this constant current through infinite resistance? Well, it dissipates internally. V, open circuit we'll call it, will just be equal to I of our source times R internal. And in this case, it was about 10.6 volts. So unlike the ideal voltage source, we want this to be very, very, very big. For then, as long as we plug into something much smaller, all the current will go through here. It will ignore this giant. So we want an infinite output impedance for an ideal current source. We want our int, which is our output impedance of our current source, to be very, very large, unlike the voltage source. Okay, so let's summarize all that. So a ideal voltage source would create a fixed potential difference across its terminals no matter what. We can't have that. We're stuck with real voltage sources that are series combinations of an internal resistance and an ideal source. 
And the lower that internal resistance, the lower that output impedance, the better. Uh, an ideal current source pushes a fixed amount of current through it no matter what. And again, we can't have that. What happens if we just don't connect it to anything? So we model that real current source as an ideal current source in parallel with an internal resistance. Now, in contrast to the voltage, we want this resistance to be very, very large. The closer to infinity this internal resistance becomes, the more ideal the current source becomes. And that is the difference between a real and an ideal voltage and current source.